We're in the section of Ephesians that he's talking about our walk as believers, how we walk. We walk as those who are wise, we walk as those who are in the light. We walk in love, and that has an impact on family life. We saw last week uh, that the biblical family is to have a wife who submits to her husband uh, as the church is to submit to Christ. And that is a difficult task. We considered that last week. But husbands also have a difficult task. The biblical family is so different from any family in the world and from the world's standards. For the husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. What I preached last week, uh, feminists would not approve of. Right, um, but I think when you look here at the sheer weight that Paul gives to husbands, it's well more than double the amount of material here is laid upon the conscience as a husband and what we are expected to do. And if the ladies think it's hard to submit to your husband, think of the men, how hard must it be to love as Christ loves? That's a tall order. The biblical family is the best family that there is. It's not perfect. Husbands and wives who are believers who seek sincerely to follow these commandments are not going to get it right all the time. There are going to be disagreements. There are going to be tensions at times. There may be arguments and, and so on. That happens because we are sinners. But the closer we grow towards God, surely the easier it must be. If it's hard for a wife to submit to her husband, it becomes easier as the husband becomes more like Christ and as she becomes more like Christ. It's much, much easier. And, and so, uh, in this way, what I say today again, like last week, uh, we are to seek to fulfill it, although it's hard. I want everyone to seek to listen to this sermon. Yeah, I said this last week as well. I'm preaching particularly to husbands. This is not for you, ladies. It's not your turn. You said, we listened last week. It's now our turn to switch off. Not at all, because there are reciprocal duties here. The more we understand our spouse's duty, the better we can help and support them in that. And we'll see that in due course. And as I said last week, we definitely don't weaponize passages like this. Brought in your husband and saying, listen, listen, now, now you really need to take this on board. We want to support one another in this. I think as well when we think of passages like this, and I recognize not everyone here is married, uh, but there are um, duties here on the whole church. Paul talks in Timothy, or sorry, in Titus chapter 2, that older women are to help train younger women. And what particularly are they to do? What well, says older women help younger women to love their husbands? I wonder if you've ever thought about that for a moment, that it is the duty of older, more mature women in the church to help train the younger women to love their husbands. Sometimes uh, older women, particularly in, in our culture, are more reserved with what they say. But actually, you have your place in supporting younger women. And there's a whole list of things that you can help younger women with. It's not just disregard, but it's, I'm just highlighting that. It does apply here. If older women are to help younger women to love their husbands, surely then older men also have their role in helping younger men. And to sort of paraphrase a little bit what Paul says in Titus 2, uh, he's speaking directly to Titus, but we could say older men are to urge the younger men to be self-controlled. That's what Paul tells Titus to do. Work with the younger men to urge them to be self-controlled. So there, in that sense, there's something for many more people here rather than just um, you know, you maybe widowed or you may be a widower, but there's something here for you to do as well. I recognize as well there are others who have never been married. Perhaps you're seeking marriage but regardless of whether you will be married or not, there's a lesson here regarding your relationship to Jesus Christ. Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And so we should try to understand more of what that means for each one of us, whether we're married or not. Remember that in heaven, there is no marriage. 
Hello. Uh, we look forward to seeing our husband or our wife in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven. But there is the marriage supper of the Lamb. There is that relationship with Christ, that union with him, which can never and shall never be broken. And I want us to begin there uh, this evening to see that this marriage relationship is a picture of how much Christ loves the church. And that way it's relevant for all of us today to really consider it. Notice it tells us here, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I want to emphasize here that the love that is being spoken about is the love for the church and not the love for the world. The love that Christ has is the love for his own special people and therefore it is a special love for them. There is a sense in which we can speak of Christ's wider goodwill to all people. Uh, God doesn't desire that anyone should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. God sends common grace into the world, where the sun rises and sets and the rain falls upon the good and the evil. God provides blessings to people who are unregenerate, but also even worse than that, are reprobate. Do you know the difference? Unregenerate uh, means that you're still in your sins, you're still bound by sin. But we don't know that person may later be converted or they may not. But the reprobate are those whom God in his sovereign wisdom has passed over. He hasn't elected them to everlasting life, but he has he's passed over them. And they are reprobate. They are those who are definitely going to a lost eternity. And yet even still, God shows kindness to the reprobate in this world. The, the very fact that there are good things in the world, there is pleasure, uh, there is uh, good food, there is friendship, there is fine music, all these things are kindnesses that come from God. And let's face it, the hell-deserving sinner does not deserve any of these things. So there is a, a general disposition towards all people of, of kindness, a willingness to save. But yet here in this passage, Paul is quite clear. The love that is being spoken about is a special love, a unique love. If we were to go back into chapter 1, you remember that treasure chest of God's blessings? They are blessings in Christ. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. God hasn't chosen everyone. He has chosen his people. He has chosen certain ones and passed over others. And this is his church. And these are the ones that Christ loves in this unique way. And this is the example for husbands. What sort of love does Jesus have for his elect, for his church? Well, it's not a love that's in mere word. It's a love that's in deed. He backs up his declarations of love with action. Someone may say they love you, but do they mean it? Jesus proves it. And the first way that he shows it is that he gave himself up for the church. Verse 25 we see that at the end. He gave himself up for her. It's speaking there of his sacrifice. A husband that's worth anything would step in front of his wife if she were in danger. It's our role to protect. But the Lord Jesus Christ goes far over and beyond what naturally men do for their wives. The Lord Jesus Christ sacrificed himself body and soul. He gave his very life for her redemption. The Lord Jesus Christ was willing to go to the cross in order to save his people from their sin and from the wrath of God, which was due to them. And that's a sacrifice that no one else could make for you or for me. No one else can stand in your place before God. No one else can, can enter into that breach between your maker and your judge and yourself. 
No one else can stand there and say, look, I'll intercede for them. I'll take their side. Because everyone else in the world are sinners. Every other person in the world is in the exact same problem, the same situation, the same miserable lot as you. Guilty, hell-deserving sinners. But there is only one man who has ever lived, who has been perfect, who has been righteous. The God-man even Christ Jesus. He is able to sacrifice for sin. He is the Lamb of God, without spot and without blemish, who willingly laid down his life for the church. That's love. That is true love. That is a great, infinite, beautiful love. It's not, uh, it's not to be confused with with the idea of love there is in the modern world. That is real love. Christ dying for the church. And then we see a second part to this love of Christ in that he sanctifies the church. Verse 26. Why has he given himself up for her? So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word the Bible talks about sanctification. We know we're talking about holiness. Why did Jesus die for his people? It wasn't merely to take away the punishment that was due to them. But it was to break them free from the bondage of sin. You and I, since our conception, have been enslaved to sin. Until the new birth, we're enslaved, we're captured, we're under sin. We can't break free, we can't change, because our very disposition of our nature is always inclined towards evil continually. It's what our heart is good at doing when we're dead in our sins. Our heart is good at inventing evil, planning evil, always thinking of ourselves as number one, instead of worshipping the living and true God. But the Lord Jesus gives himself up for the church to sanctify her. To make her holy. To make her blameless. Uh, Titus 2 verse 14 gives us this same idea. That Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. And to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Zealous for good works. You see? There's the redemption that's necessary to buy us back. But there's also the purifying us, purifying us for himself to be his own special possession, his own treasured jewel, zealous for good works. And how is it that Jesus sanctifies us in the church? What well, tells us there? The washing of water with the word. The emphasis here is on, on the word of God as the instrument of sanctification. Listen, Jesus himself prayed in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This Bible that you have here, this is the truth. This is true. Every single word of it is true. And this is the means or the instrument of your sanctification. Do you want to be holy? Well, friends, you're not going to be holy by closing the Bible. You're not going to be holy by leaving it on a shelf all week and never reading it. You're not going to be holy if you avoid public worship. You're not going to be holy if you avoid the means of grace, mets and so on. Places where you can learn and meditate on the Word of God. You're not going to be holy even if you just read quickly and then be done with it. See, this Word needs to sink into our hearts. We need to heed it. And when we listen to it, it must be with faith. Believing the words that we read on the page. And if there's a promise there for us, as God's people were to accept the promise and cling to that promise. If there's uh, something it teaches us about God and about his nature, we're to accept it and believe it and turn it into worship. If there's a command in it, we're to admit, this is my duty. And if we have sinned and broken that commandment, we're to confess that command, confess that sin. And endeavor in God's grace to obey in the future. If there's a warning in God's word, something that would make us tremble, 
Faith would lead us to quake, to shiver the fact that we've offended God and broken His Word. Whatever God's Word has for us, we're to respond in faith. You see, it's not all the same. Reading it one day will give you one thing, but reading it the next day may give you something else. You see? Because God's Word is varied. It's like a rich diet, isn't it? You don't just have potatoes and potatoes and potatoes. That's not all that you eat. There's more to it. To have a healthy diet, you need to eat it all. And God's Word provides that. And He works through it to bring the Word and apply it to you. And when you receive that Word prayerfully, when you're studying that Word expectantly, when you're listening to the preaching of God's Word with faith, God will use it in your life. And he will use it to sanctify you. To make you holy. And what is the goal of this sanctification? Is it just to make you and me a little bit better than we are? Is it just a tinkering around the edges? Let's try to make a little bit of moral reformation here and there. Let's get rid of our worst qualities. That's, that's how we may think of sanctification. We may think uh, of one particular sin in our lives, and that's the only one we focus on. That's not the goal of Christ. In his love for his church, his goal is set out in verse 27. He sanctifies us so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Can you get any better than that? Can you get any cleaner than that? Can you get any, any holier than that? That is the full extent. Christ's love for his people is so great that he's not content with just sanctifying you a little bit. He's concerned about your glory. He's concerned that you would be presented to him in splendor, in the, in the beauty of holiness. Those of you who are, are wives, do you remember your wedding day? And do you remember how um, you prepared for your wedding day? You, I don't know how long it took you to pick your dress and to pick what way you wanted your hair done and your makeup and your jewellery and all this. And then not only did it take you a long time to pick all these things and make it just so, but then you had to make sure the dress was clean and without spot. Or wrinkle. If, if you saw a spot on it, just before you were going to put it on, you might be a little bit, man, I need to get rid of this spot, I need to clean it up. And you would take great care on, on getting the dress on, because you're going for your wedding. And that is the picture here. Only it's sort of turned on its head, isn't it? Instead of the bride getting herself ready, which is partly true, it is the husband getting the bride ready. It's the husband who has pledged himself to her sanctification. It's the husband who has pledged himself to her glory. So that she might be all the more beautiful. Without spot or wrinkle or blemish. Because Jesus is concerned about our holiness. And if you're a believer here today. I want you to see that Jesus not only is he concerned about your level of holiness at the moment, not only is he concerned when you are engaging in sin, but Jesus has the big picture, and he has pledged himself by covenant to sanctify you completely. So that when you go to heaven, dying in faith, falling asleep in Jesus, he will accomplish this perfectly. Absolutely perfectly. It's hard for us even to contemplate that. Because you and I have never seen anything in this world that is without spot or blemish. We've never seen anything that is truly holy. All that is holy that we know of is by faith and not by sight. But if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, one day you shall be so holy that you shall be free from sin. Not simply free from committing sin, but free also from the desires for sin that you find in your heart. Free from those fallen lusts in the heart that desire things that are contrary to God's will. 
All of that will be absolutely gone. Free from sin. Perfect in Christ. And that is certain, friends. And we're to take this, this verse not only as something to learn of our husbands, as we'll do in a moment's time, but to take this verse in faith into our day and daily battle against sin. We're to mortify the lusts of the flesh, put them to death. We're to put on righteousness. How do we do that? We do it in faith. Lord, Lord Jesus, don't you love me enough? You've pledged yourself to me to make me perfect without spot and blemish. We take him at his word and we follow him. And that's why we make use of the means that he has given. The washing of water with the word. We make use of this because he will use it to sanctify us completely. So there we see an idea of how much Christ loves the church. He loves us enough to give himself up for us as a sacrifice on the cross. He loves us enough not simply to save us from the consequences of our sin, but to save us from the filth and the pollution of that sin, and to sanctify us completely so that we may be presented to him in glory. And friends, just before we move on to the husband's duty in light of that, take a moment to think of what praise and thanks is due to Jesus Christ for such amazing love. It's indescribable. We'll never praise him enough for that love that is for his people. Because you think, in the context of how he has elected some people to everlasting life and passed by others, what is the difference between those of us who are elect and those who are not? Both hell-deserving sinners. Both have sinned against God. Both have broken all the commandments of God. And yet, we who are in Christ are given such love that we do not deserve. That should promote humility in our hearts. But then we see in the second place that this is a pattern to follow. A pattern for those of us who are husbands and a high standard for us to seek to live up to. The bar is high. If we can truly appreciate how much the Lord Jesus Christ has loved us, Husbands, for us to say I need to follow that and love my wife to that degree, as Christ loved the church. And that means that a husband's love for his wife must first be sacrificial. As Christ loved his church and gave himself up for her, so too a husband is to sacrifice for his wife. He's to give himself up for her. Uncommon that he has to do that physically, that he has to lay down his life for her. But he should be prepared to do that. A husband is to, um, is to give himself for his wife. Remember, the wife's duty is to submit to her husband. She's the helpmeet or the helper suitable for him. She comes alongside and follows his leadership in the home. But the husband won't abuse this principle. He will uh, seek to serve her as she serves him. He will lead, but not in an arrogant way, not in a domineering way, but in a self-sacrificial way and with love. Colossians 3 verse 19 is the parallel text here, and it says this, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Paul highlights perhaps one way in which husbands can get this wrong. They can be harsh of their wives. Because there's a way that we can speak to one another as men. It's, it's hard for us to offend each other as men, or harder. But women, uh, if we speak in the same way to them, that would be a harsh way to speak. And so if we're to love our wives, we have to be so careful how we speak to them. Or 1 Peter 3 verse 7 says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, Showing honour to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. It's an interesting verse, that one, because there are only a few places in the Bible where it talks about prayers being hindered, 
or God not hearing particular prayers or God rejecting prayers. And it's interesting that Peter ties this in with how husbands treat their wives, that that may have an impact upon the prayers that are offered to God. Husbands should seek the understanding of their wives and to give them the love that they are due. The Lord Jesus' love for his church meant that he humbled himself. We can call that self-abnegation. He laid aside his prerogatives for the sake of the church. And so ought we not to do the same, to humble ourselves for the sake of our wives, to love them without harshness. And that means that we have to be different from the way the world treats their wives. You think about how men speak about their wives, maybe calling them the ball and chain or things like this, derogatory comments. Sometimes men can say all sorts of things about their wives that just should not be said. The marriage relationship is to be a private relationship. If there are difficulties, they should be solved within the marriage. And only um, if you can't solve them amongst yourselves should you then go and get help and mutually agree to have that help uh, in it. But some men spend time uh, doing their wives down, speaking it negatively about them. And that is not love. Look at what verses 28 and 29 teach us in this regard. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. There are men who love their own bodies. There are men who maybe spend hours in the gym trying, trying to perfect their bodies. The way they speak about their wives is a contradiction. We are to love our wives as we would love our own bodies. How foolish it is for us to do anything against our wife, to anything to her hurt or harm. It's like cutting off a part of your body, self-harming yourself. No, nobody, it says here, um, no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it. And that should be our attitude towards our lives. So there ought to be this sacrificial love, but also... Um, in this love it's a love that is focused on her eternal best interests that's the way I would define love love is not a feeling although, although feelings are involved we understand that love is not a mere feeling it's not the same as lust love is actually a commitment to the person's eternal best interests and, and so the unbelieving world really knows nothing about love but we here are believers ought to know more about it. Jesus loved the church to commit himself to our eternal best interests, to sanctify us completely and present us to him wholly and without blame. And so, as husbands, we are to love our wives with that eternal best interest in view. Um, we should want our wives to be sanctified. We should want our wives to grow in grace. We should want them to grow closer to God. We should want them to develop in the fruit of the Spirit. And therefore, as husbands, we ought to lead our wives in that regard. Now, we saw last week there can only be one head in the home. And it, it's the biblical pattern, it's God's infallible wisdom to make the husband the head of the home. Well, that means you have to set the leadership and you set the bar and you set the agenda as men. And if your love is for your wife, if it's real love, well, then the eternal best interests of your wife will be something that you will set the agenda for. And so that involves things like family worship. It's the husband's duty to lead in family worship. Now, there may be a case where the husband does not believe and the wife has to do it perhaps with her children. We understand there are exceptions, sadly. But where the husband is a believer, it's his duty to set that tone for the whole family. And particularly in this relationship between him and his wife. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
And so if the word of God, verse 26, is that which Jesus uses to, to sanctify us, then the husband will take that on board and say, in our home, we must read God's word and study it and understand it. We must make it a priority to be under the sanctifying influence of the word of God. The husband sets that to him. He takes the leadership in that regard. And so it's the husband's duty uh, to make sure that, that as a family they go to church as much as he can. I understand there are times where the wife isn't a believer and so on. But it's the husband's duty in the ordinary uh, relationship for him to say, look, we need to go together to worship God because this is the best place for our souls. It's also the husband's duty if he's concerned about his wife, his wife's eternal best interest, it's his duty to pray for her, to pray that she'd be sanctified, to pray that she would grow in grace. And if he truly loves her, will he not find it easy to pray for his wife? You know, maybe prayer is a hard thing, that's true. But think about your prayer life, even if your prayer life is weak, what things do you pray about? You pray about the things that you love. You pray about the things that you're interested in. And whom, should, whom do you love more than your wife? And therefore, you should pray for your wife, for her eternal best interest. Not simply praying for help and strength. These things are important. But pray for her soul. Pray for her sanctification. If she's not converted, I know for some of you that's the way that you pray for her salvation. These things are absolutely essential. So the love of a husband for his wife is sacrificial. It focuses on her eternal best interests. Then thirdly, um, it's a faithful love. It's our duty to be a one-woman man. One woman, and that's it. There are no rivals to her. We saw not too long ago when we were considering the diaconate and the, the qualifications for elders and deacons and so on, and that, that is particularly laid down. Uh, you're disqualified if you're not a one-woman man. But it's true for all men, for all husbands, that there should be no rivals to our wife. Verse 31 makes it clear uh, this is uh, leading us back to Genesis and the original institution of marriage. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The King James has the idea of leaving and cleaving. Uh, I think in Genesis, I'm not sure if it's here in this passage, but in Genesis I think it has that idea. You can't. Uh, although you still honour your father and mother, you can't have quite the same relationship with your father and mother because a marriage is between two people made one flesh. And so that means that if you're a father or a mother of someone who's got married, you have to allow them that space to leave and cleave, that they set up their own relationship. It's hard, but nevertheless, that's uh, what you have to do. Uh, it, a marriage is between two people. But the two people are not treated as two people. They are one flesh. They leave their father and mother and they cleave together into one. And Paul describes this as a great mystery, to be one flesh. And husbands and wives have a relationship that has no parallel at all in the world. You can have best friends, but best friends are not the same as a wife. Because with your wife, you are one flesh. And that means we must be faithful. That means there can be no rivals. And let me just put two passages of scripture. Proverbs 5 verses 18 to 20 says this. It's a, it's a Solomon advising the younger man. He says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful dove, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Now, sadly, in the world around us, and as it's depicted in TV and films, that is an acceptable thing. It's not even an acceptable sin. 
unfaithfulness in marriage is seen as acceptable. You maybe made a mistake with your first marriage. It's not someone that makes you happy. It's not someone that you really love. So it's not wrong for you to break off that relationship and find someone who makes you happy. You see what that does? That puts you at the heart. It's all about me. It's self-seeking. My pleasure. My idea. That's not what God's Word says. It focuses on the one woman. Because there's a covenant relationship between us. And we've become one flesh. Or 1 Corinthians 6 verse 16. I quoted this this morning or paraphrased it this morning. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, the two shall become one flesh. See why it's such a, a sinful thing to commit adultery? Because there's a one flesh relationship that is torn apart. And a union with someone else, a strange woman, uh, as it talks about, an adulterous woman, a forbidden woman. And that's why God's word is, is full of these admonitions to be on your guard. Uh, and as Christians, we have to be careful as well. Take heed to yourself, lest you, when you think you stand, you fall. Uh, sadly, we hear uh, high-profile ministers, or one we heard about, and uh, perhaps you heard about it during the week, of a high-profile minister who had engaged in some form of adultery in his past, and has been put out of the ministry. God's Word is full of these commands, full of these admonitions for a reason, because the temptations are out there. Remember Joseph, a godly young man who was taken away from his father's house, taken away from all those who could encourage him in faith. He was taken away from the place of, of the true worship of God and he was thrust into Egypt as a slave and there was Potiphar's wife who was determined to have him. And she was a temptress. And what does he do? He flees from her. He can't get away quickly enough because he knows that it would be wrong for him to do that. Friends, we must, if we love our wives as Christ loves his church, we must be a one woman man. But what if we think through some of the more tricky situations? What if your wife is not a believer? Does that negate anything that I've said so far? Remember last week, uh, for the, the wife, the poor wife whose husband is not a, a Christian, he's still the leader in the home, but it's hard to submit to him, especially if he's leading in a direction contrary to the word of God. Uh, and the admonition to the wife was for her uh, to, to still submit and to, to, without a word, perhaps win him over to the faith. But what about if you have an unbelieving wife? Well, I think... Everything that has been said so far still applies. As Jesus loves his church, so you are to love, uh, love your wife. Remember that Jesus loved his church even before they were converted. Jesus loved us even when we were dead in trespasses and sins. Even when we were unworthy of that love. We still are unworthy of that love. But he loved us. And he worked for us even before our conversions. Think of that great Old Testament picture of love in the prophecy of Hosea. Hosea, the prophet, was commanded to go and marry a harlot. And then, when she was unfaithful to him again, to go and forgive her. And it was a picture, wasn't it, of Israel transgressing the covenant and going away from God. And yet God still loves and loves to redeem and to reclaim and so, friends, even if your wife is an unbeliever, it is your duty to love them in a sacrificial way. But remember what I said about their eternal best interests. To have that in mind at all times. To pray for them, to encourage them, to speak to them, but to show them such a love that they would have no reason to quibble and say, uh, to criticize you and say, what sort of Christian are you? Show them such love that they would even be attracted to the gospel. For believers, believers uh, who marry one another in the Lord, there is a covenanting together, isn't there? 
At a wedding ceremony, there are vows where the wife promises certain things and the husband promises certain things. And that's why uh, we should not have a separation in marriage easily. The Bible only gives two reasons that permits divorce. Adultery and willful desertion. And that's true for the whole world. That's the way God would have it for anyone. But how much more for believers uh, who live uh, having made covenants together. They're united together as one flesh. And what God has united, let not man tear asunder. This picture of marriage between a husband and a wife and between Christ and the church is a profound mystery, Paul says. Verse 32. It's profound. It's a mystery. It's been revealed, but it is something that we can plunge into the depths of it and to think more deeply about it. This union between the husband and the wife is not easily explained with words. It's such a strong and profound union. And so to the union of Christ and his church, where Christ makes us one flesh with him, that is a profound mystery and not easily put into words. That Christ is our head and we are his body. And that we are so united together that we can never be separated from him. Is that not profound? How can we describe this spiritual union between Christ and his church? But what then, in closing, for those who are single, or perhaps even for those who are not in a good marriage, what is there for you? For we recognize that not everyone is in this. Uh, not everyone is in a biblical marriage, a believing husband and a believing wife. But what for those in other circumstances? Well, I would turn your attention to Isaiah 54, verse 5, where it tells you to fear not, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. Your worth as a human being never comes from a relationship or from a status. Your worth as a human being does not come from whether you've got a ring on your finger or not. That's not how we measure who we are. But our worth as a human being, our identity, ought to be in God. Your maker is your husband. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. And so, uh, husbands, as they are to love their wives, as Christ loved the church... So if the relationship is broken or hard, we should find our confidence and our hope in the greater, relig- the greater relationship, th- that profounder mystery between the bridegroom and the bride. Because remember that everything is heading in one direction. Time is all leading in one way, towards eternity, towards heaven, towards the time when there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a feast, a wedding feast. And we're all here invited to that feast. The parables teach us that, don't they? It's a great feast that God has provided. And anyone can come and partake of the feast. It's a feast to celebrate the marriage of the Lamb, the bridegroom, with his bride, the church. And so make sure that your relationship with Christ is settled. Make sure that you are married to the Lord. Make sure that you have covenanted with him, that you have taken vows to him, to submit to him, to honour him and to obey him. Make sure that you've taken him to be your redeemer. Make sure you're trusting in him to sanctify you completely, that you may appear before his presence without spot and without blemish. Make sure you're trusting in his great sacrificial love for Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. Amen.